Sound Speeds, and welcome back to a Speed Bumps podcast. This one, I think, is episode 23, unless I'm getting totally off in my numbering scheme. And if I am, I'll put it up on the screen, or you can just look in the description or the title of this video, and you're going to be able to see what it is. Same setup as in the past. We have ourselves the BPTRX from Deity recording the audio coming from the, B, uh, the uh, Deity WLAB Pro Tan Edition. And then we also have our Insta360 recording in 5.7K, because why not? It is still bright. Let's try to have our very best possible uh, image that we possibly can coming from the Insta360. Even though it's an action cam, I like the ability of being able to swing it around and record whatever I want to in whatever direction, whenever I want to, however I want to. That's what we're going to do. So let's waste no more time and get right into this episode. For the first topic in this episode, I thought we would discuss how to find a rogue sound that is driving you crazy on set. Now, let's just say that you're on location and you are in a new location and locations department did only it was only able to treat a certain number of things. Maybe you're in a bar and there's uh, there's it's noisy. Everyone's setting up and you didn't have a pre-call. So you were not going to give production a free time because if you do so, there could be problems with that. I'll get into that in another episode if you really want to hear about why that's an issue. But if you are out there in the field and you are trying to find a rogue sound, the main thing I will tell you is that most sounds that you run into on set, if it is an electronic type sound, there is power involved. So if it is a mechanical type sound that requires like, it means like a refrigeration unit, an air conditioning unit, or a fan is on, those are electronic based sounds. You're gonna be able to hear that sound and therefore you're gonna say, oh, that sounds to me like it's a mechanical type thing. Our hearing goes between about 20 hertz and 20,000 hertz, but our ideal optimal frequency ranges that we're able to hear are closer to the center. That's where the term A weighting curve come from, comes from. It basically, uh, even though our hearing is 20 to 20,000 hertz, those are not hard cutoffs. It is still going to transition and fade out somewhere near the edge. If you start to lose your highs because you have something like presbycusis, you might not be able to hear above 14K, 15K, 16K, something like that, in which case it kind of rolls off earlier. But the, the reason I'm mentioning that is because when it comes down to hearing sounds, it may not be something that you're able to hear if it's noisy. And in that case, you look for things that could potentially be electronic noise sources. You look for things that are potentially gonna have power to it. If you're in a bar, you might look around and say, hmm, what is here? Air conditioning unit. That might be the thing that you're hearing that's noisy. Then you might wanna troubleshoot that and you say, okay, that was definitely something I might, you might not have even heard it over all the noise. But if you happen to hold up a Kleenex next to a vent and you see it blowing, or you put something on the, uh, like a little uh, ribbon or something like that on the end of your boom pole, and you see a ribbon blowing around, or you put your microphone straight up to a vent and it starts blowing the microphone and like that, it's gonna sound bad. You can do that too. That's gonna to tell you that the air is on. And even though they say, oh no, we killed the thermostat in here, it's still blowing air. There may be air handlers in the building or maybe the, the fan is still in auto mode. Excuse me, the fan may still be in auto mode, but they turn the, the, the heating and cooling to, um, to off. If the fan is in, in, in on, then it's gonna constantly blow. If it's in auto, it will cycle on and off with the heating and cooling cycles. So if you are talking about trying to, if we're talking about trying to hunt down a noise, look for anything that requires power. It could be battery power. If people uh, like the electricians are bringing in lights and you know that when um, the light comes in, you know there's a fan on that particular kind of light, listen to it, try to determine if there is a fan on in that light because sometimes the electricians are able to kill the fan on the light. If it's an LED, it's probably not gonna overheat if you're on a climate controlled stage. So you can ask if you can kill that. Sometimes what it requires is you getting to them in advance notice, especially if they're like, you know, put in the ceiling or something like that, because they may say, oh, I can't kill the fan. There is a fan control, but there's a switch on the light that you actually have to flip and it has to be a separate channel in the dimmer, in the on the dimmer board, and they have to flip that off because sometimes what will happen, especially if you're using mover lights or moving lights, then they will turn off it and not burn the bulb, but it will still have the fans on, and they can't kill the entire thing because the cycle up time is too much. But if you have, if they have them switch the, the flip the switch on it, then they have independent controls of the fan. So if they turn off the, the the lamp on that, they may be able to kill the fan as well. If something is electronic or mechanical, there's a potential for it to have a noise associated with it. Cars on set, 
a car comes up and it and you you it parks, they may say for simplicity's sake, leave the car running. Don't do that. It's going to be bad for sound. But the way that you would end up approaching that is you would end up saying, hey, when they drive up, can they kill the engine? And they may say, well, it's a shootout. The person drives up real quick and jumps out of the car. Yes, but they have to put the car into park, and it's no biggie for them to go park and hit the button, park button, and now they jump out. It's no biggie. If they have to, turn, uh, to twist the thing and turn it off, then they can very easily go, you know, put the car in park, twist, and then they jump out. It's quick. They're designed to not be taking a long time to jump to, to, to jump out of a car in a hurry, turn the key, and the car dies. Another thing that happens is it goes beep, 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 and you might happen that over your dialogue too if you end up having the door that's open and the car is running or the keys are in the, even in the ignition. In which case then you might want to talk to the, um, to the Teamsters or the Props Department, whoever's supplying the car, and ask them if it's possible to pull, pull, pull the fuse that's, psych, that's, that's controlling the beeping on the door. Sometimes that's an option too. The main point here is, if you're trying to identify the source of a noise on set, is are you starting first with the th you should start first rather with the things that are providing power if it is any kind of a sound that is artificial if it is a sound that sounds like something created by a machine then look for things that are powered because a machine requires power if it is something like a wind chime that is not powered except by wind then you're going to have to listen for those more natural type sounds and to try to determine what that would be from. A door opens up, you hear a squeak. It's pretty obvious where the squeak comes from. It's from the door. If a wind chime is going on, you know it's windy outside. That's when you tape around the wind chime and there's your solution. But those are not mechanical type noises. Those are real world things. So if someone, if you're trying to identify when it gets quiet, you're like, whoa, what's going on? Where's that sound coming from? If it is a low end sound, probably it's coming from some sort of a rumbling machine. If it's a higher pitch sound, probably it's coming from something electronic. So those are some general rules of thumb for you to keep in mind when you're trying to hunt down a sound. Here's another little trick that I'll leave you with. If you go into a bar and it's really noisy and you can't really hear to see if all the different refrigeration units were killed, you know the deep freeze in the back is still on, but you know that there could be noises that are closer. You go and put a finger on top of each one of the cooler units and if it is vibrating, you know it's still on. So that's when you say, I need this killed to the, to the, when you just start to walk around with the locations department and they're going to say, but that one wasn't making noise. Here's the thing. If it is cycled off right now, it will still be rumbling because it's still maintaining its coolant, coolant most likely. But if it is not because, you know, because it could just cycle down and it could be insulating. The thing is though, if you open the, 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 the thing up and put your hand inside, you're not going to be able to tell if it's cold, if it's weather, if it's been killed and it's trying to maintain its coolness and you open it up, you're letting all that coolness out. What you're going to want to do is drop a finger on it and drop a, peri uh, a, theory, uh, a finger on it periodically also, because if it is vibrating, it is still on. Sometimes they're too quiet to hear, in which case you want it killed. They may say, but that's all I heard. Here's the thing. Even if it's cycled, cycled down now, it's going to cycle up as soon as they call roll sound. It's going to be noisy. So kill it before it happens. There you go. For our second topic in this episode, we're going to discuss what windscreens actually do to sound. Plain and simple, let me ask you this question. If you were driving up at a nightclub at night and you were hearing the music, what frequencies are you hearing? The bass frequencies, right? Plain and simple. The reason why is because with your voice, if you are going to try to project your voice to a farther distance away, it takes you more power to thrust the bass out a farther distance. Mids and highs? are basically gonna just travel a farther distance. But bass is more closer to omnidirectional. It dissipates out in all directions fairly evenly. Mids are gonna be a little bit more narrow focused and highs are gonna be very directionally focused. But the bass frequencies, those, it takes a lot more power in your lungs to push the bass out at a farther distance, which is why you go farther away from a microphone. The thing that you start to lose the quickest is the bass. And why when someone talks directly in your ear or you get all the way up on a microphone, that's where the proximity comes, a proximity effect comes in where there's an increase in bass frequencies because you're so close to that microphone. So going along with this, let's follow along with our thoughts here. To create the sound, it takes more energy. To dissipate it, it takes more energy. If you have one inch of acoustic treatment and you are trying to dissipate your audio, the highs you can pretty well expect it to be 
treated so that way it's not going to be bouncing off of the the wall and back in nearly as much the mids might be attenuated some the lows might be attenuated very little this is the reason why one inch of acoustic treatment might end up treating the highs just fine but it will take four or maybe even more inches of something like you know that's that's designed for acoustic treatment like owens corning 703 rock wool safe and sound fire and sound something like that it will take more inches to dissipate the lower frequencies because there's more energy there the lower frequency something is the longer the wave is and the higher frequency it is the more of those waves you're going to lose if you go through something like that's a hard surface so keep that in mind because now we're about to transition into windscreens they are sponge usually if you're talking about a foam windscreen a very light windscreen and therefore it is going to dissipate the highs more so than the lows and mids but it's important to note that different windscreens attenuate the highs at different rates and different amounts the mo the more you hear of those highs the more acoustically transparent the windscreen is how can you tell if something is acoustically transparent plain and simple if there's a cloth for example you want to see how acoustically transparent it is try to breathe through it if it is able to be breathe if you're breathing through it very even very easily and evenly through it then you know it's pretty much acoustically transparent however if you are not able to breathe through a material very easily or it takes a little bit more strain and you're aware of it then it is not going to be as acoustically transparent here's a great example during the shutdown of 2020 we started wearing masks and those masks were still being used in 2023 this is if you're watching at some point in the future so what did masks do well i happen to have a video on masks and what they do exactly and it's all calling understanding mass speech masked speech i promise i can talk but if you are talking about what you can hear frequency wise and then talking about a mask and what that does are masks like the kn95s that we wore on set are those good for acoustics no and the reason why is because it muffled the highs and mids because it's not designed for acoustics it's designed to make a better seal for virus protection that's the whole idea behind those masks right that's why we wore them but they're not designed for acoustics so you breathe through them and they were more difficult to breathe through than it would be just breathing normally now you're still able to get your oxygen levels because you're basically breathing stronger you're breathing harder but if your mask was straight up against your face it was hard to breathe through because at that point the surface area of the mask you're trying to pull in air from all angles but if it's close to your mouth you're like snugged in here to your mouth then there's very little surface area as opposed to one of those big you know duck build ones that went this way or the big you know pointy ones like that in that case then what it was able to do is it was able to take this big surface area to try to maximize the surface area for you to breathe through so that wasn't uh trying to choke you out nearly as well with having the higher amount of um of uh, virus protection the kn95s so windscreens in a nutshell if you want to see how acoustically transparent is in it put it on and listen to how much of the highs are being attenuated if you then put on a softy listen to how much of the highs are dissipated versus something like a Sinella Leonard ball versus something like a super uh, super softy or a bubble bee uh, a bubble bee um, a wind killer or a, 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 a wind bubble or a, you know there, there are any kind of the systems that are out there basically for wind protection the right coat cyclone the Zepp, uh, the zeppelin series they have the modular zeppelins the wind jammers the super shields the you know anything the sonella pia uh, the the piano and the uh, pianissimo those kinds of things every single bit of that has different acoustic properties but the thing is usually the best companies are going to make sounds uh, make make the wind protection be acoustically transparent as much as possible while still attenuating the sound but there's got to be a trade-off because of physics you can't just block out all the wind from hitting it without blocking out some of the highs it's going to be a reality the amount of highs that are dissipated is what really matters though if it is something that you're just trying to take the curse off of the air and you just want a little bit of attenuation something helping like a right coat baseball for example then you might take just the curse off of the wind just a little bit maybe swishing of cueing a microphone really fast something like that but if you start to get overwhelmed in that those will be pretty transparent 
but it will perhaps protect against a little bit of wind. But if you start to run into too much wind and it starts popping that microphone, you got to amp up your wind protection. At that point, you got to look at something that's going to be a little denser. It's going to start to attenuate those highs a little bit more. Some microphones have the ability to give it a high shelf. You can boost the highs on a microphone to try to compensate for the appropriate windscreens that you would use with it. DPA is one of those. It will have a high shelf that you, that you use to increase a little bit that will help you to better compensate for the lost highs that are actually attenuated on that if you put it in wind protection. Personally though, I don't normally require a high shelf. I prefer to not boost frequencies on my microphone. I personally like the way that the DPA sounds by itself. The 4017B, uh, for example, sounds perfectly fine to me without you putting the high shelf on there. It doesn't bother me at all when it's not on there boosted. So there you go. That's what you need to know about windscreens and how to listen for what it's actually doing. Oh, one last note I'll say. If you're talking about fidelity, I have a video called the microphone spec that we're, that we're missing and will never get. If you watch that video, there is something I talk about that is also affected by your windscreen. If that particular thing, and I'm not gonna give away the spoiler because I want you to watch the video, and in about two minutes you're gonna see that, uh, that video pop up on the screen, but you just saw a card for it. That thing right there that I'm talking about in the video, it will be affected by the windscreen. If it is affected very little, awesome great windscreen it's very transparent hopefully to the sound and it's going to continue to sound good but if it is affecting the sound a lot and very little attenuation for example to the actual wind protection get a better windscreen because it's not going to be good so keep those things in mind because those are very important that missing spec that i'm not going to give away right now because you're going to see it in about one minute uh, pop up on the screen in the, in the outro of this video and the actual amount of acoustic transparency. So there you have it. Another episode of Speed Bumps Podcast in the can. I like using that phrase. In the can reminds me of the old film era when we actually put film into the can for it to go off to the developers. Wow, I miss those days. There's a lot that can be said about film. I really like it. Some people have said, what about the purring sound? The like that of film going through there. It was never really an issue because it was in a different frequency range that wasn't affecting most of the time your voice. Yes, we heard it, but it wasn't something that was really overwhelmingly bad even in the world of analog. They were able to get it, get it out of a lot of the uh, the shots just fine, the lot, a lot of the sound just fine. You very seldomly ever heard it because you're pointing microphones the correct way. Cue the microphone away. It's going to attenuate down. The rest of it's going to be in the noise floor of the audio most likely. If you're doing your job right, you're not going to really notice it. In a very quiet room, you might notice it, but then it might have music and something behind it because it's a romantic scene or it's a quiet scene and there's stresses or whatever. And if you really hear it, chances are someone's not going to be talking. If they are talking, then you can you can try to push a microphone in really close and cue it off of the, 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 the bad sounds, you know, coming from the the film and it's overwhelming. Maybe they'll use longer lenses and try to get in cl closer, give you a fight chance, who knows. But it's not normally an issue. But regardless, thanks for watching this episode of the Speed Mills Podcast. I'm talking too long because my overblown my minute outro. So thanks for watching. Watch those videos I mentioned earlier and put cards up on the screen for, and I'll see you in the next episode of the Speed Bumps Podcast. If you'd like to ask a sound-related question to be answered in a future episode, send text, audio, or video to sspsoundspeeds.us. Want to record this outro? Details in the description below. Find us on social media and online at www.soundspeeds.us. Be sure to subscribe and turn on notifications for more sound-related content.